Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Bernie Manette, and I am a teacher here at Humber College, and I also teach at the University of Guelph Humber. And the course that I teach is called Visual Communications. And Visual Communications, what's that? Visual Communications for this thing is, you know, visual communications, visual cultural, media literacy, art history, all these things have sort of been combined. And the easiest way to look at it is the trouble with images. Images cause us no end of grief and worry. They represent politics, they represent power, they represent who has power, who has no power, they represent gender, desire, advertising, all sorts of things. And we're trying to help students, I say students, but really people, come to terms with it. And one of the core foundations to this course is the idea that I, me, myself, you, us together, we are responsible for the meaning of the images that we see. And this is, this is a really important concept, this idea of responsibility. I'd like you to stand up. Those of you at home, I'd like you to stand up. And to, to reiterate this statement, you can raise your right hand if you want to, right? I am responsible for the meaning of the images that I see. Can I hear that? I am responsible for the meaning of the images that I see. Thank you very much. You may all sit down. What we have, and, and I love this picture, right? Whoa, images. So what does this number mean? This is the, this 135, this is the number of people who died during protests against a cartoon that was labeled Muhammad. And this has always struck me as being very poignant, and it also strikes me as the incredible power of images. I mean, these people, you know, the cartoon was issued by a Danish newspaper, it, you know, it came out and people across the Middle East erupted. They were offended, they were insulted, and, and they went crazy. They, they, they just, you know, they were burning Danish flags and stuff like this, to the extent that people were killed. This, to me, is startling. And what it, what it speaks to is, is this idea of choice. I see an image, I choose how I'm going to respond to it, and this, to me, is the most extreme action of that. And so this, to me, speaks of this power of images, but I think if you spoke to the people who died, they would say that it was the images' fault. Right? Not their fault, not the, not the people around them. And, and, I, and it, it goes back to these are choices that we make. So students come into this program and, they're, and they, they believe they understand images. They, they come from a visual culture. It's all about the web and, and YouTube and, and, and they're very used to seeing images. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that this is all really kind of new to them. They see an awful lot of images. Uh, their grandparents may have seen, let's say, 100,000 images in their lives. These people are seeing hundreds of thousands of images a year, right? And, and rather than seeing and looking at them, they're just sort of letting them wash over them without giving them too much thought. To the extent that a woman who looks like this is considered to be incredibly beautiful. So beautiful, in fact, that women around the world are dying to be like her, right? And one of the funny things, one of the insights that I developed, and this was in the middle of a class, right? So I'm talking away and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you get this. It's like in order to, to wear these clothing, you have to be unobtrusive. So feminine beauty has no impact on its surroundings. To me, this is, this is startling. So all these women are striving and die, dying to fulfill an image that is essentially invisible. Whereas when you see a woman who looks like this, right, we think, wow, you know, it's, it's, there's something wrong here with this woman. But to Rembrandt, who painted this painting, and if you looked at many of the, the, the women in my class, they actually look more like her than like her. You know, this is considered to be somehow ugly. But really, this is a healthy woman with healthy appetites. And in a sense, the beauty isn't so much in the shape, but is in the person itself. So what we try and do is we want students to spend more time with the images that are, they see. And so one of the things we get them to do is they're going to build a visual journal. And I'm going to take you through uh, an image today 
it sort of replicates a bit of that process. But the visual journal is, has a bunch of rules. So it has to be a book. In other words, you have to be able to carry it around. Um, it has to be handwritten. Now that one, that one, every year I get a, a delegation of students and faculty, why do we have to handwrite it? It's very simple. It's harder to do. Robertson Davies wrote that word processing is the end of democracy. And the reason why he says that is that it's too easy to create DREC through a word processor. You actually have to create it yourself. And, and I don't necessarily agree with the extremity of it, but I do agree that they need to break the sort of digital media chain when they're creating this, this journal. So they have to handwrite it. They have to choose seven images. So we have a 14-week term. They've got to have one image every two weeks. And then what they're going to do with this image is they're going to work with it. So they're going to take the image, and it's the image as found. And so the image has to have people in it, because you know, this is humanities. Uh, it has to have a caption or a title. And they have to properly cite it, because of course we are a university. Uh, there's a few things it can't be. Uh, it can't be a picture of a celebrity. One of the reasons why it can't be a picture of a celebrity is that celebrities always look like celebrities. They always look like themselves. And it's very difficult for them to unsee the, the stardom and actually work with the image. And images can't, you know, no images of kittens, right? I mean, sorry, no, no, no. So they're going to work with these images. Um, in a sense, what they become is they become the author, the editor, and the publisher of their own journal, right? So this brings in a lot of traditionally Humber or college items like working to deadline, doing stuff again and again and again and really creating something. And one of the amazing things for me is it's, it's been an incredibly humbling experience doing this. Because the students, many of them, put forward so much effort. So this is the picture that I've chosen uh, to take us through. And this is uh, boy soldiers from the Iran-Iraq War, photographer unknown. And so this would be the first time that the student would see the image, and they would have to start discussing it. You know, they'd have to sort of you know, try and make sense of what they're seeing based upon you know, the juxtaposition of the image and the caption. Okay, so usually what we tell them to do is, well, what's in the image? You know, what's there that's caught your attention? Uh, what do you see? What's interesting? You know, students would often look at a picture like this and they'll go, they'll try and give me a quality assessment. And quality is based on exposure and focus, right? Not about aesthetics or the content. And so they'll say, well, it's a good quality image because it's in focus. Or it's a good quality image because it's well exposed. Or th the one that really cracks me up is they'll go, this is an old image because it's in black and white. And so one of the things, of course, we're trying to do is broaden their horizons, get them to understand things more than that, that black and white doesn't necessarily mean old, right? And, but really to start to talk about an image and spend time with it. The second step, of course, and this is why have you chosen it? What, wh how has the image hailed you? That's one of the talk, things we talk about, it, is images call to you. And how has this particular image call, hailed you? What, what has attracted your attention? For an image like this, because these are obviously uh, young men or boys, uh, the students would see their own youth inside the image. And that's a, actually a really interesting part of this. You know, they could talk about their own experience playing soldiers as children. They could talk about the fact that you know, they look like their friends or, or anything like that. And it's hard for them sometimes because they're trying to situate themselves with the image that they're looking at. Right? This image is harder to deal with because it's not so obviously emotional. And one of the problems for the students that I could tell you for sure is that none of them had heard of the Iran-Iraq War of 1980 to 1988. So this is, again, another thing is we try and broaden their horizons a bit. And then finally, what does it all mean to them? You know, what is, you know, What's your first attempt at understanding what the meaning of this image is? And you know, when I see the journals, uh, sometimes this first section of the image and the caption is, you know, some students will write seven or eight pages just going into this incredible detail over what they see in the image and, uh, and beginning their understanding of it. And it's just, it's really humbling sometimes to see the sort of effort that people put into it. The next step in this process is to take away the caption. Now this is a very difficult part of the entire situation, of the, of the entire exercise. The caption dominates the image, right? I could caption this image anything now. I could say this was, you know, Walt Disney movie, um, you know, 
set break. And you don't go, oh, wow, that's, that's no big deal. That's kind of trivial. And, you know, and you'd be right to, a, to a, an extent. But it's very difficult to no longer see the caption. That's why I've taken away all the text from it. It's to sort of give you an experience of what do you see now in this image now that all the words are gone. And it gets interesting, too, in, in our situation, is we want the students to get really comfortable with, you know, this looking at images. Because they are, these students are, are, you know, want to be journalists, want to be photographers, want to be PR professionals, and they have to get used to living with images. One of the things that you might wonder about is that you've now seen this image six times. And it's not your typical PowerPoint presentation, because usually they've got a lot of pizzazz, a lot of movement, and this sort of thing. And the purpose of that is just to get used to it, to get comfortable with an image. Some of the images that we show or some of the images that the student choose are very upsetting. You know, uh, W. Gene Smith Minamata with the, the, the poor deformed girl with mercury poisoning. I mean, the first time you see it, you're so blown away with shock. But after you get used to it and you see, you know, that this girl, this poor deformed girl is actually in the, one of the best places in the world in her mother's arms. So as we go through this and we understand it and, and students come to grips with it, you know, like I said, for me, this is a very humbling experience. It's amazing what happens to you from time when, you, as a teacher, and you say, I want you to do this, right? So I get these incredibly well-designed journals with, that are beautifully crafted with excellent, not always excellent handwriting, but excellent ideas. And it, it's something that I love to do. It, it's, it's affected me in the way that I look at images. It's affected me with how I teach the course. Um, you know, and the final thing that we're we talking about, because I am running out of time, is we get the students to crop the image. And what we're trying to do is the students move from sort of being, you know, just describing the images found, delving into the meaning, and then now actually trying to manipulate the message that the image has. So as we go from this image where we see a bunch of boy soldiers, there's a gun in the background, and it's for, for, it's actually quite upsetting, and we crop it to just this fellow, well, all of a sudden, he could be going out on a date, right? And we want the students as editors, as authors, as publishers, to realize what are the ethical implications of this kind of manipulation, right? In a world of Photoshop, in a world of, you know, this incredible digital freedom that we have with information, if you don't have an ethic, it's amazing what you try and get away with. And we want the students to understand that, that it is not a trivial matter. So we, we crop the image, we play God with the image, as it were, okay? We get to, to, to really feel control of the image that we're working with. Changing the frame and focus, again, this is this ethical problem of what do we take from it, what have we removed from it, you know? Because is it really right to turn this man from a boy soldier fighting in a forgotten and horrible war into some sort of a male model. And so what do the students think? What do they get out of it? Well, they complain about their hands hurt because <laughs> they've been handwriting this whole thing. Um, they complain about, they go, it's repetitive. And I go, yes, it is. It's something that you've got to work out. We're talking about developing a practice of looking, okay, so that they can truly feel that they understand their responsibility with the meaning of images and that this is something that they, they don't do it all the time, but this is something that they are capable of doing, and they, and they have this journal that proves it. I want to thank you very much.